Hello RMHS, I'm Megan Hubbard and you're watching the first episode of Inside RMHS, a show that takes you inside the life of our school. Hello and welcome back. For the last couple of weeks, we've had the camera crew running all around the school trying to find the best stories that impact you. The changes made to the cafeteria, the Massachusetts film winners, Violet and Vanessa, and of course, the highlight of October, Shocktoberfest. Our next segment deals with a new policy regarding lunch at our school. Many of you, as I'm sure, have noticed that there have been a couple changes this last year. Kristen Morello, the cafeteria department head, was able to give us a more inside look on what's going on and what we should be expecting. Hi, I'm Kristen Morello. I'm the school nutrition director for the Reading Public Schools. I've worked here for nine years in this school district and I've worked as a school lunch director for 21 years in this state and some time in Connecticut. There's been a number of changes to the entire school nutrition program this year and they're based on two separate laws. One is a federal law called the Hunger, Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act of 2010 and then the other one is a state law about the competitive food sales. So it limits what we can sell for drinks, like now we can only sell water, we can't add, sell anything with added sweeteners. That's why we're not selling ice cream right now because there's a different set of guidelines for each type of snack whether it's a muffin or sweet or salty or a yogurt or a drink. Um, that's why the vending looks a little different this year. So you'll see a lot of different things that are available for what we call a la carte purchase. That includes what we sell um, to the before and after school program at the elementary schools to what we would sell at the snack bar at the high school. The Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act changed how we sell lunch. And for the first time, it's mandated that one of the items that you take on your tray for it to be what we call a reimbursable lunch has to be a fruit or a vegetable. And that's never happened before. So I think I know one of the questions you'll probably ask me later is about all the changes, but that is one of the biggest changes. And the reason that change was made was the Institute of Medicine, uh, after they do all their research for the dietary um, guidelines and recommendations for healthy um, Americans, they made the decision that the USDA should change the way the feeding programs are done so that every child would get a fruit or a vegetable on their tray. However, there's also, they want us to make sure they get a fruit and a vegetable and they've categorized them by color and uh, th their healthfulness and we need to serve more green, red and orange vegetables versus all potatoes. So those are some of the most dramatic changes that were based on the law. I think some students are very satisfied and I think other students maybe have an expectation that we haven't yet met. Uh, part of what I've been trying to do over the past few years is meet with the student council and I'll come out in the cafeteria and I'm the director so I run all eight schools but there's a manager here so the manager tries to use both the, the food service staff in the kitchen to they talk to the students every day they're the ones that know them so they'll find out if the kids really like or really dislike something or if it's a challenge to get them to take something or if we serve something on the main lunch line and the counters really know and everybody's over getting a hand hamburger, we know that's not a big seller. We're having um, a pasta bar once a week and a, and a fiesta bar once a week and we called it a pizza party once a week and we're offering several different items on those days so that if a student wants a vegetarian nacho they can have that or they could have a taco or on pasta day they could have something that's vegetarian or alfredo or chicken or beef. So we're trying to listen to the customers by looking at their trends and trying to adapt what we do to meet their needs and, and we're hoping that we'll get more feedback from them so that we can continue to change and hopefully meet more of their expectations and get more customers. 
Well, I think I, I think I decide what goes on the school lunch menu mostly by what we have on our purchasing bid, which we have to make those decisions almost a year in advance. So that's a bit of a challenge. If I asked you what shoes you wanted to wear next week, would you know a year and a half in advance? No. So some of that is a bit of a challenge because we have to decide what we want and bid it legally and then buy from that bid. So uh, we have to use our best guess and trends. And then we look at what students are buying. If we put something on the menu and we let it go a couple times because if it's a main entree we let it go two or three times see how it goes see if we can change the bread it's on or what we complement it with because sometimes it's just new and students haven't had it well like we, I keep going back to some of the same things but what we did is we took a lot more time in the way that we purchased food this year we did some taste testing with kids uh, way back last January we're part of a purchasing collaborative with several towns so we changed the chicken patty, we changed the spicy chicken patty so that they had uh, more actual chicken in them. We're doing a lot with uh, full muscle chicken breasts um, on salads and in wraps. We're also serving a lot more whole grains, which some kids really like and some kids don't, but that's also part of the law and it's all about the nutrition. I think one of the biggest difficulties is being able to get in front of the kids and find out what they want. Um, I'm managing eight different schools with a, a lot of different staff, three different levels, breakfast, lunch, catering, and to be able to actually sit down and speak with the kids honestly about what our limitations are and what they would like to have is a huge challenge. Um, we try to educate the students about what we have coming up, and I do speak to the freshman class every year to try to engage them and tell them what's happening, but it's a big school. There's 1,400 kids just at the high school. I think the biggest challenge is being able to communicate with the customers and find out how we're doing and what they would like different. You know, most of the things that happen are quite endearing. We see a lot of kids and, you know, they get really, really excited about whether they have a healthy school lunch tray all put together and they're excited to find out what new foods they can try. And most of the time, the funny or cute things that happen um, are just from a kid telling you how much they like the food that you made because the staff that I work with, um, they've been here for years. Many of them are moms or grandmothers and they, they don't get paid a lot of money and they don't get to work a lot of hours, but they derive such pleasure from working with the kids and giving them something they'd like. So most of the funny stories I probably have are people trying to give the, the boys a little bit more food or some girl who they think looks a little skinny, they'll try to give them a bigger portion. But um, all that's changed too because now we have uh, all these rules where we have to portion all the right amount of food and make sure everybody takes the right thing. So. And now it's time for the Rocket Highlight of the Month the spot where clubs and teams can talk about what they're doing to spread the word. The presidential elections are coming up, so maybe it's time that you could get involved or even just interested. I'm Vincent Giacalone. I'm president of the Right Club. David Graham, vice president. Jack Gotzel, vice president. I'm Jim. I'm clerk. It's been going for a long time. It's a strong club at RMHS. I've been coming here since my first day of freshman year, and I've always felt welcome from the beginning, and it's a great club at RMHS. It's really strong. It's been here for a long time. Uh, well, the Right Club is um, an organization. It's like if you're a conservative or a Republican or if you're just middle of the line and you're interested about politics, you can just come. Uh, the door is always open on Tuesdays after school. It doesn't go too long. And uh, we just talk about politics. Uh, we welcome those that are from the left or that are liberal, and we tend to like to debate with them a little bit. They make things funner. And uh, it's really easy to get involved. Well, if you're a Democrat, then like you can still come, and we welcome yeah. Then we're, we're not mean. We just like to debate. I mean, we'll disagree with them, but like even um, Mr. Deeb, who runs the right club, he's voting for Obama in the next election. So it, it's really nice to hear other opinions, and we like that. Uh, a typical right club meeting, we just come Tuesday after school, and we just, a lot of times, we're not even necessarily discussing politics. We're just hanging out, having a fun time. Of course, there's probably the majority of it is talking about politics, what we think, what we saw in the, the debate uh, last Thursday, what we think the predictions for our next one's going to be, how the election's going to go. Uh, should politics be talked about in school? In certain scenarios, uh, like in English class, we watched um, parts of the debate. It should be more center of the line and uh, give both sides of the argument. Most of the time, I'm only seeing one side and I have to go and find my own to back it up. And it's, it's a little unfair to uh, have a different opinion in a class. Any students in the school that are interested in coming and talking about the debate, I mean, I see on like Twitter and Facebook that a lot of people have opinions on the election, and we'd like to have them in our room and uh, 
we can talk about the issues and we can debate and it's just a good time. All are welcome. And All are welcome. And any seniors that are voting age should definitely get involved and learn about what's going on with this election if they're planning on voting so they can make an informed decision. If politics aren't your thing, maybe this next segment might be of more interest to you. The RIV Club entered a 72-hour film competition in which they had to write a script, shoot, and edit a movie. They got second place, and here to talk to us is the producer and actress. See what you think. Hi, my name is Vanessa O'Connor. I am the president of the Rocket Independent Video Club. Some people have formerly known it as the Film Production Club, but now we're the RIV Club. Um, I was the team leader for the Massachusetts Flash Film Festival that um, the RIV Club did this year. I'm Violet Tecito and I got involved in the Massachusetts Flash Film Festival because I'm part of the um, Rocket Independent Video Club. We were required to have a prompt, a character, and a line of dialogue. The character we were required to have was supposed to be Joan or John Curran. We picked a girl, Joan, and that was played by the advisor of our club, Angela Merrill, and she did a fabulous job. And she also held up the prop. We were required to have a CD somewhere in it, and so, um, so that's kind of how we worked in the CD. Very original. <laughs> um, and then we were required to have a line of dialogue, and the line of dialogue was... Life's too short to miss out on the good stuff. <laughs> It started off with these shoes, these stiletto shoes, and then it ended with these shoes, the stiletto shoes. Um, we kind of incorporated the shoe factor um, a lot into it. I don't really know why, but I thought it was very, it was very interesting. And you know, sh as weird as it sounds, shoes can tell a lot about the character, and that's how we kind of that was the theme of our thing. How we played it out was the shoes, how the character is, and so we started off with the secretary who was um, having an affair with a married man with these stilettos and it kind of opened like that and it ended well I'm not going to tell you how it ended but it ended um, with the stilettos that's all I can say Friday we had to go to school and right at 3 o'clock we started filming all about till 1030 again and we were just trying to film as much as we could Saturday morning we filmed a lot of the scenes um, with Doug Cowell he was the um, he was the man who had the affair um, and Angela Mara also came in on that Saturday, and we just tried to get those done as quickly as could in the morning. We ended up finishing, I think, about 4 o'clock with the extras we had to bring in. And then us ourselves, we started filming just the part where people who were on our crew for the whole day and before um, we filmed that night. So we probably ended up about 10.30 again. So I went home and I edited it on um, at home on my final cut, and I was up till about 4, th four in the morning, 3.34 in the morning. Um, so that was very tiring, but thankfully I rough cut the whole thing and then we met back um, Sunday Sunday afternoon um, and we kind of watched it and we kind of critiqued it. We all wrote down what we thought we needed to change. If we had to like fix some audio things, we re-recorded the audio. Um, and then I went back and edited it and I drove it up to Belmont at 6.30 and I think that was, I was like breathing. So we drove up to the cinema studio and there was a red carpet and there was like an E! New style E! New style um, reporters. Beforehand, watching all the um, films that the other people made was very interesting because a lot of them did very creative things that were really cool and so that was really fun and then like watching other people get awards for getting their thing, for getting like for doing such creative works was so cool because they were so excited and you were excited and it was just a very exciting time and there was like a very high level of energy in the room. And so finally then they say second place goes to and they say Urban Youths which is the name of our team. Um, and I just couldn't control myself. We all like got up and we're like oh my god oh my god we started like hugging each other and whatnot and you know walking down to receive the award. That moment I was like I've made it. It felt awesome because I've never won anything before and well like the first time entering any kind of contest coming in second place that's like not what you expect ever. <laughs> so that was a very good feeling. The hardest part of the 72 hours was probably staying with it for 72 hours and trying to get it on like a very tight time schedule because I mean you have only 72 hours so. It was hard, I enjoyed it at the same time as the fact that it was a lot of effort. And I might continue, I might do it again in the future. Not like a lot, but.
Hey. Hello. Did you um get the flowers I sent you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How can I help you? Hi, I'm Carrie Johnson. I'm the CEO of Parkway Firms. I have a meeting with Joan Curran, the sales representative. She'll be ready for you in just one minute. Thank you. She's ready to see you. Carrie Johnson? Yes. Joan Curran, it's a pleasure to meet you. Let's get started, shall we? Thank you so much for coming in today. Hey. Hey. So I was thinking we could skip out for lunch. It's just that I have a lot of work to do. I don't think I can. Okay, well, just saying. Life's too short to miss out on the good stuff. Just give me a sec. Okay. We're right back. So, here's the demo. I think you're going to be really excited about what we have to show you today. Oh, sorry. I forgot my briefcase. Oh, no problem. Go ahead. Go get it. So, I'm really excited that you're here. You're one of the first people that is going to get to see this demo. Um, we've really put some interesting, interesting material on this demo. So, um, I will be gone for a few days for work. Now, on a totally different note, our cameras went around the school to find out what Halloween movies scare you the most. It's quite surprising. My, my favorite scary movie is... The scariest movie I've ever seen. Final Destination. Um, my favorite one is the classic one, Psycho. Probably one of Stranger Calls. The scariest movie I've seen is Taken. Halloween Town. Not rec well, I'm not really a scary movie person. The scariest movie I've ever seen is um, Stephen King's The Shining. The Omen. My favorite, well, not really favorite. St. Jaws. <gasps> oh, no, no, no. Uh, the, scariest movie is, uh, the scariest movie I've seen is Paranormal Activity. By 30 Days a Night. It's psychological. The scariest movie I've ever seen is Winnie the Pooh. You scared me. Godfather. How was it? Why'd you like it? It was awesome. Yeah, it was pretty. Oh! <laughs> Winnie the Pooh. That was really scary. <laughs> it was freaking dark. I was like, oh my god. Tell him to go. Because it's, it's, it's recording right now. It's recording right now. Oh, yeah. It's that you jump out of your your skin half the time. Scary. Is it scary? <laughs> it's 
not really scary. I can't think right now. I guess like, what's going on. It's scary movie. He's just laughing all of them. Like. I can see. I saw the record button. Like. No one's seen Psycho. Nah. What is wrong with people? What is humanity? Hey. Yes, and if you haven't seen Psycho, maybe there's something wrong with you too. And this makes an excellent segue into our last, but certainly not least, segment: Shocktoberfest. We got to sit down with two of the members on the committee, David DiRocco and Natalie Vinciguera, and we found out that scaring people takes a lot more than you think. Hi, I'm David DiRocco. <laughs> I'm Natalie Vinciguera. And we are two of the seven members on the Shocktoberfest committee. All right, well, I believe that it was Stephen Gordon, Jackie Tremblay, and Aaron McIntyre. Their junior year came up with the idea and started it just right off the bat. They were um, inspired by the castle thing that happens in Gloucester, the haunted house that they set up where they have the live actors. So they were inspired by that and uh, decided to do it for the drama book fundraiser. Yeah. Castle of the Dam, right? Yeah. It's usually brainstorm, like we get together and we have a meeting kind of after like Shocktoberfest happens to pre like prepare for next year over the summer mm -hmm. and um, propose ideas, just talk about what we've been thinking about for the next year. Yeah, and sometimes I just like go up to friends and family and just ask, what's your biggest fear? And then we try to work off of that to just create the worst possible scenario for anyone's fears yeah. and bring it to life. I like I like doing like research on what scares me. A lot of the ideas come from nightmares that we have, and then a lot of the time, like if I'm camping, I'll like walk to the bathroom of the campsite alone in the dark and think about like see what ideas come to my mind that are scaring me the most. Yeah, and a lot of the time there are rooms that mimic rooms from last year. Like usually there's something that has to do with bugs and something that has to do with like creepy circus clowns and everything because common common fears yeah those are okay. pretty much like prevalent in everyone's nightmares if anyone's interested in being a part of it and they're not part of the drama club they're they're free to do that yeah and sometimes people who know of it and love it and always want to be a part of it but aren't in the drama club come up to one of us and we just like invite anyone in because the more people screaming the better <laughs> yeah once we have done a plan for the idea of all the rooms, we go through and we decide how many, like for the characters of the room, how many of each person there's going to be, what they're going to be wearing. Yeah, and that also has to do with the technical side as well. Break it down with costume, makeup, lighting, effects, props, just everything. And then we pull from the drama club supply. Character roles. Uh, we choose the character roles by like going through each room again. Like when we're brainstorming for the idea of the room, we think about um, what characters we want in the room. Also thinking about people that we know are going to do Sharktoberfest and what parts they would fit in. Yeah, exactly. And we also hope to have at least two rooms when there can be just a bunch of people. Like the auditorium is a huge, vast space, so that we like to put as many people in there as we can to like bring everything out because if there was like three people in the auditorium like there is in a room in the drama suite then it just won't work. Yeah, having, having um, roles that have a large number of people is also good because when we're casting and it's very difficult to cast and we want to yeah. give everyone a role then there's those rooms that like if someone's I, I forgot to come to the meeting, I forgot to sign up, can I still be part of it? Then we have ones that have like the numbers are flexible, like you could have more people or less people in the room. Yeah, and I think this year we have 68 people who volunteered to be I, a part. I think so, yeah. Yeah. This year is one that we like, we were brainstorming about. Um, I brought up the idea of like a 1930s hotel, like kind of the way like the inside of Tower of Terror looks in Disney yeah. World, that kind of thing. and. Um, we tried to, because we were brainstorming ideas for places and like ways that you could fit in a bunch of like very varied themes because you want all those different fears without like, so you can't have a theme that's too specific, you need to have something broad. So we decided to make it kind of where each room of the hotel like represents a different person's fear. There's a, yeah, there's a game show room where they're bet, there's like rich fancy people betting on how people are going to die. And then we're doing... So, well, the most complicated room that we're doing this year is the, um, in the hallway near, there's a bathroom that, the, the hallway goes this way, there's a bathroom over here, and we're going to do, there's a, an effect called Pepper's Ghost, where you set up a clear 
like plate of glass that's reflective and you set it up at an angle so there's a scene that the um, the audience and the people on the tour can't see set up and it it is at the angle where it would reflect in the glass and you have the lights off on that scene and then as they're coming up if you bring the lights up on that scene it looks like a ghost that's appearing yeah so a lot of these rooms are scenarios that hopefully no one runs into in <laughs> life um, and we do the best we can to make it as frightening and like we add pop-ups so then we think of a room as like alright well this isn't very scary it's just a scene that they watch but how can we bring it like attacking towards the tour group that's walking through. In in general my favorite part is the night of like when we have everything set up we don't have to stress anymore and that you just get <laughs> you kind of get into the swing of like going through the tours and it's it's fun yeah. when you're when you're in the room and you're screaming yeah. at people and making my them scared. My favorite part is the last group that walks through cuz it's just a big sigh. Like everyone, at first when it starts off, it's kind of awkward getting to the swing of things with your room. It's like, why am I doing this with you? But at the end, everyone's so into it, and then the last run, everyone just goes all out, and then we all get together and just have a debriefing <laughs> at the end, asking how everything went and congratulating everyone, because it really is a big accomplishment that everyone's proud of. And if you weren't able to check out Shocktoberfest this year, definitely check it out next. And that about wraps up our show. Once again, I'm your host, Megan Hubbard, reporting from RCTV Studios on Main Street. If you liked our show or would like to help shoot or edit a clip or have any great ideas, please email us at insidermhs at rctv.org. Finally, if you're part of a club or sports team or have something you'd like to share, please let us know. Thank you for watching. <laughs>